Okay, welcome to this uh, roundtable uh, celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Journal of Peace Research. My name is uh, Emil Gudal and I'm the editor of JPR. We have one change uh, to the panel. Uh, Amelia Hefner Burton wasn't able to make it to the conference uh, and she's replaced by Isaac Svensson, who's also an author uh, in the uh, anniversary special issue of JPR. And JPR, as uh, many of you know, was established in 1964 by Prio founder and first director Johan Galtung, and later edited for 28 years, uh, no less, by uh, past ISA president and uh, longtime Prio researcher, uh, Nils Pedigledic. Thematically, uh, JPR is broadly oriented. The journal is explicitly multidisciplinary and committed to uh, methodological pluralism. We're particularly interested in publishing cutting-edge empirical research. While the journal, journal is a leader in uh, quantitative analysis of peace and conflict, including uh, through the publishing of dataset articles and requesting authors to post their replication data online, we also very much uh, welcome good qualitative empirical articles, uh, theory, and review pieces. Uh, JPR has, over the past decade or so, uh, been uh, highly ranked on the citation indexes. We currently uh, are ranked sixth, both on the political science and IR uh, journalists of uh, the Web of Science, which we take great pride in. We're also uh, listed second on the Google uh, Scholar uh, Diplomacy and International Relations list. And we receive a little over 400 uh, submissions a year and publish roughly 50 articles. JPR is also a green open access uh, journal, which means that the LO, um, authors post the final post-review version of their manuscript on their own uh, web page. And we have a true global both authorship and uh, of, uh, audience. Many of the scholarly debates that have been central to the JPR and uh, the broader field of peace and conflict research are summarized in a number of review or overview articles published in the uh, issue 2 of 2014, the anniversary special issue. Uh, and I'm very pleased to have uh, several of the authors uh, of uh, special issue articles and one of the guest editors, Jack Reedy, here today to speak about the uh, special issue. Uh, the uh, issue came just uh, off the press now in March uh, and is also available online for free for the next uh, four weeks at least. Uh, we also have a few hard copies here today uh, and Sage uh, have more copies uh, at their booth. Um, we also have two eminent scholars uh, serving as uh, discussants, Jack Olson and uh, Scott Gates. Um, we have uh, the, uh, the contributors to the special issue who will be uh, speaking are Gerald Schneider uh, on globalization, Monica Duffy Toft on territory, uh, Vali Kubi on natural resources, and Isaac Swenson on uh, international mediation. But first, uh, let me turn to Jack Levy, who was the co-editor, along with Halvard Buhag, uh, of the anniversary special issue. Jack is Board of Governors Professor of Political Science at Rutgers University and affiliate at the Salzman Institute of World Peace Studies at Columbia University. And he is also past ISA president. Um, so Jack, we're very pleased to have you here. <coughs> Thanks, uh, uh, Henrik. Uh, it was a Pleasure working with you and uh, Halvard on the on the special issue, and with the contributors who took their tasks uh, seriously, responded effectively to our comments, uh, did a great job of summarizing their respective uh, uh, literature in their respective areas, and they managed to do so under rather tight restrictions as to uh, length. Um, anyway, given what I think is the division of labor among the introducers, the paper givers, and the uh, uh, and the panels and discussions, I'll, I'll try to uh, give a very brief sense of, of some of the um, articles. The, the special issue begins with an article by Nils Peter uh, uh, Gladich and J Jonas uh, Nordkill and Harvard Strand on the, the status of uh, peace, both negative and, and positive, in the study of peace and conflict research over the last 50 years. It's a very nice conceptual uh, and quantitative description of the, the evolution of the field. Uh, special issue then turns to what is certainly one of the most lively, sustained, and productive research programs in, in IR during the second half of JPR's first 50 years, that is the, the democratic peace, and more recently the, 
uh, you know, the broader liberal piece. Um, Harvard Higley uh, tackles the, the democratic piece uh, at the monadic, dyadic, and systemic levels, both uh, between states and within states, and tries to integrate the theoretical arguments and does that very nicely. He also examines the um, alternative hypotheses that uh, peace creates the conditions under which democracy can flourish, um, and uh, the argument that the relationship is spurious and what we really have uh, is a capitalist piece or perhaps a territorial uh, piece. I'll leave it to uh, Gerald uh, Snyder to talk about uh, his article about the two important variations of the economic piece and to uh, Monica Toff to talk about uh, territory and, and war. The next two uh, articles examine ethnicity and ideology in, in civil wars, um, noting that civil wars are more likely to be in, initiated by ethnic groups than any other group. Uh, Elaine Denny and Barbara Walter argue that ethnic groups um, generally have more grievances uh, against the state because leaders um, of heterogeneous societies often favor their own groups. Um, um, uh, ethnic groups also have an easier time mobilizing support because of their uh, identity and geographic concentration and more difficulty bar uh, resolving bargaining problems because of the relatively inelastic uh, nature of ethnic uh, identity. Um, in their uh, analysis of ideology, Francisco gutierrez Sanin and Elizabeth Wood argue that uh, ideology matters for civil war in uh, a couple different ways. Uh, both instrumentally and normatively. Instrumentally, ideology helps socialize um, uh, combatants with heterogeneous uh, motivations into a co coherent group to pr prioritize competing goals, reduce principal agent problems, and help uh, coordinate uh, external actors. Normatively, ideology provides the motivation and constraints that uh, help explain some non-interest-driven uh, uh, behavior. Um, next article is on natural resources, and I'll leave it to uh, Valerie uh, Kuby to, to talk about that. <clears throat> Next article by Ron Smith looks at the economic impact of military conflict, um, giving particular interest in, <coughs> um, uh, attention to methodological problems confronting any quantitative assessment of uh, economic costs of, of conflict, including da data limitations, um, and also uh, uh, in particular attention to some of the uh, how the different dimensions of, of cost can be aggregated and uh, evaluated. Uh, <clears throat> um, Todd Sandler uh, assesses the analytical study of uh, uh, terrorism, uh, looking at trends in terrorist attacks, economic consequences of terrorism, effectiveness of counterterrorism, causes of terrorism, and relationship between terrorism and liberal democracy. Um, Emily Hathaway Burton looks at the social science literature on human rights. Um, she emphasizes, uh, uh, she looks at the conditions most conducive to, to human rights, including um, conflict and weak or, or overly powerful state institutions. And she also looks a little bit about um, what can be done to uh, deter or re reduce ab abusive practices. So she concedes that uh, we know much less about uh, that than the causes of those abuses to begin with. <clears throat> the next two articles. Um, focus on methodology and, and, and data, continuing a rather distinctive contribution of uh, JPR uh, since its founding. Uh, Philip Schroep uh, offers what he describes as a deliberately polemical critique of the ways in which uh, scholars use statistical methods. A few of his uh, seven deadly sins are the use of kitchen sink models that ignores effective collinearity, uh, the, the dismissal of predictive power as a criterion for uh, assessing the validity of a model, um, the improper use and interpretation of frequent, uh, frequentist uh, uh, statistics and significant tests, set tests, and the advantages of Bayesian uh, approaches. And, and finally, he uh, points to the confusion between statistical controls and experimental controls. Uh, so that's a, a lively piece. Um, uh, another article on, on data. Uh, uh, Christian Glevich, uh, uh, Niels Metternich, and uh, Andrea Ruggeri emphasize the um, uh, interaction of sy systematic data collection and theory development um, uh, uh, and how that's the, the interaction has generated uh, uh, progress in, in peace and conflict research. Um, they give particular attention to the growing emphasis on different forms of disaggregation of, of data in, in conflict research. Um, and uh, consider some of the implications of big data 
for the analysis of, of peace and conflict. Um, the opportunities created by big, big data is also a theme in the, the Schneider uh, uh, article and the Toft article and maybe some others I can't remember. Um, and the special issue ends with an assessment of the literature on uh, mediation by Peter Wallenstein and uh, Isaac Svensson, and Isaac will talk about that uh, later. So it's a, it, I think it's a great issue, it's fun working on, and uh, I look forward to the 100th uh, special anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Jack, coming up soon. Um, We'll move over to the uh, paper presentations. Uh, first is uh, Joel Schneider. Uh, his, uh, the title of his piece is Peace Through Globalization and, Capital uh, and Capitalism, Prospects of Two Liberal Propositions. Slightly jet lagged and spent the last night with my doctoral students in the chessboard. I need structure, and PowerPoint uh, will provide this kind of uh, structure, a short summary uh, of my article. But I would like them to also say something about my uh, career and how much this career evolves to uh, the Journal of Peace Research at first. I will say something very, very briefly about my criticism of commercial uh, liberalism, and here I have a quote from an uh, unknown colleague who sent me an email, which was not meant for me, commenting on a former paper uh, of me, by saying that, that this is a strange paper for someone who claims to believe in commercial liberalism, uh, and uh, I will qualify this, uh, why I believe that I believe in commercial liberalism, but why we should not be naive believers in uh, certain um, theoretical concepts. Then I say something about uh, data, and I also speak about what we presently experience, namely anti-globalization, what this has on the, uh, what sort of impact this has on the risk uh, of the conflict. First, these personal remarks. I'm very, very grateful, obviously, to my co-authors, but also to the Journal of Peace Research, and especially to its former editor, uh, Nils Peter Gledic, uh, who is a co-author uh, of mine also on this very project of globalization um, and, um, and peace. I mean, we got to know each other in 1995 in a conference in Paris, and uh, we were just very desperate because we didn't find any other people who had similar mind frames uh, like us. Uh, due to Niels Peter's effort, due to uh, Journal of Pre uh, Peace Research, the situation has changed tremendously. In the United States, then, there was already a strong uh, peace science conflict uh, research community, and in Europe it was uh, taking off. But it takes organization for this uh, to happen, um, and uh, general peace research was quite instrumental uh, for this. Nils Peter uh, was acting as a co editor for the uh, journal uh, on two occasions. This also helped me to learn the ropes of editing journals and currently editing. Uh, uh, two journals. Um, so, Journal of Peace Research has transformed me and put, I would guess, not only me into a better uh, scientist, you know, professional scientist. Uh, I didn't become Scandinavian, uh, didn't make me a better person, so, uh, <laughs> but I believe it made me a better and more professional uh, social scientist. So, thank you, Niels Peter, thank you, uh, people uh, at uh, Journal of Peace Research, for contributing. Um, to conflict research, especially in Europe, where it hasn't been that strong. Okay, I've said something about this qualification by this anonymous, or not so anonymous, uh, uh, colleague. Um, I have been rambling against the opportunity cost uh, argument uh, for a very long time. This opportunity cost argument is the typical backbone um, that we have for commercial uh, liberalism. This argument is quite simple. Wars are too costly, so uh, states would not resort uh, to uh, this sort uh, of uh, political instrument. But through this, you simply assume the usage of this instrument away. And this is obviously, in my opinion, not a convincing theoretical 
strategy. Hmm? Because there are incentives under which even sometimes in times of growing uh, globalization, when the state leaders use force. And as scientists, we have to explore these conditions. And, and this leads then, in my opi opinion, necessarily to qualifications. And I have worked here on one qualification together um, with um, the Margaret Osman, where we looked at the transition to more globalization and how this affects the risk for conflict, because such transitions, they create uh, losers. Um, and uh, we have found some uh, empirical um, evidence uh, uh, for this. Um, I also discussed the literature on capitalist peace. Some uh, people who have contributed in this literature to take it uh, then as sometimes as something opposing uh, commercial liberalism. For me, it's just the opposite side of the coin, meaning internal liberalization uh, of countries and there. I'm not so clear uh, sometimes what the theoretical status uh, of these propositions are, where they are coming from, what we lack here are solid mi micro foundations, but obviously we also lack them uh, to a large extent for uh, the globalization and peace uh, literature. Let me say something uh, about uh, uh, data. What we are currently witnessing is uh, like some uh, recurrence of the behavioral revolution. A lot of the research is data-driven. This is very good, but at the same time, we do not make uh, um, progress uh, at a similar level on uh, the uh, theoretical side. And there's a slight criticism I want to advance here towards the, the special issue. There is no chapter included about how much theoretical progress we have made and what status of theory is a big T and the mean formal theory, game theory, um, the status here, for instance, the crisis bargaining uh, literature and so on, um, is something which in my opinion has contributed tremendously about the thinking, uh, about the conditions of war, um, and uh, this is an active research agenda. Um, and. Um, we need, in the future, a better match between theoretical advances and also uh, the big data uh, revolution. And here my point is quite clear. I do not believe that we will make uh, significant contributions by simply continuing on uh, this empiricist uh, road. We need also uh, sound uh, theoretical progress. And this, uh, uh, it's the, I think the time is right for that. And for this, sometimes we use the but we do not use large data sets, but we can um, restrict ourselves to relatively small um, parts. Let me say something a person who wants to qualify the commercial liberalism, but simultaneously we live in a times where uh, globalization is not the, the most important trend in some countries uh, due to the economic crisis and so on the level of globalization goes back, and I believe this is very dangerous. And we did not devote sufficient attention to this and to the risk of conflict or political violence in general. There is quite some empirical evidence, not sound theorizing, on how economic conditions affect, for instance, the risk of genocide. Here is just a slide out of Barbara Hoff's famous article on genocide, and you see here that trade openness or the lack thereof, uh, kind of, uh, say, uh, is quite strongly linked then to the risk um, of genocide. And we have to explore these conditions, also think about the empirical uh, implications of the Great Recession. There are now some empirical studies published recently in the Lancet coming out uh, how mortality rates and so on were affected by the Great Recession. Some people, like Klaus Off, uh, believe that austerity kills. Hmm? I do not necessarily believe that this is the case, but this opens up an important research agenda which is linked to this uh, globalization literature to which I have contributed uh, to uh, the Journal of Peace Research over the last two decades. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Gerald.
The next speaker is uh, Monica Davidoft, uh, and her article is on territory and war. Monica is the professor of uh, government and uh, public, not, not the professor, but yes, a I professor am. of uh, <laughs> government and public policy at Oxford University's Lavapni School of Government, and she's also a Creo Global Fellow. For having me. So it was really fun to write this article. I've been working on territory and war. I hate to admit it for probably 20 years now. And uh, so my dissertation was on it. It was interesting to go back 15 years after I had done that research, done the canvassing of the literature, to see actually what has advanced both empirically, I think you're right, a lot empirically, but also theoretically. I would contest a little bit about there not being enough theory in the journal. Uh, since many of us sort of, you know, the empirical studies that we analyze, of course, ha some of them had a pretty heavy uh, theoretical basis. But then importantly, the methodological advances. As uh, an article on territoriality, and I'm actually not going to talk about it here, we've got Nils and others in the room that are ex more expert than I am on this, is sort of the glo geographic information systems and the coding of, of uh, different kinds of groups uh, below the state. So there's been some real advances. Uh, so here I'm just going to take you through some of the data. So what I did was just sort of assess the entire field. Every, I tried to isolate every article that's been written on territory and war, and then coded them. So if you're a graduate student here, uh, there's a really nice appendix that these guys made me reduce this article. I was probably the worst offender and tried to say, please, please, can I have 13,000 words? Um, but in any event, there's a pretty hefty bibliography and appendix associated with it tracking territoriality in all its beauty, from the origins, resolution, and um, conduct of war. So it's featured as a core aspect of war. I don't think this is surprising to any of us, but I do think we sometimes forget about it. Uh, we can think about Crimea today. Uh, I actually almost wrote my dissertation on Crimea. And I, I sort of regret it a little bit now, but maybe not. Um, but you know, the idea that territory is at the heart of these things, we think in the modern era, people are not going to be fighting over land, right, over borders. But it, it turns out that it's, it, it, it has been the case historically and into um, uh, the future and today, if you look at the conflict. Origins have been privileged. Uh, if you look at all the data sets, and the, the data sets that are applied to place are, of course, cow and then mids. And then if you look at the Civil War, uh, it's much more of a mixed bag. So the Uppsala Prio data, uh, but also the minorities at risk data gets used a lot, and, and there's uh, uh, charts in the paper that go through the different data sets. Um, the, 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 the process of war fighting, where it gets lost out in scholarship, is actually the conduct of war. So we don't have as much information about what happens once violence uh, starts. We have pretty good sense of what how to end it, uh, uh, under what conditions can you possibly get it ended, and perhaps uh, continue it into the future. Where we're really shy is our knowledge in the conduct of war itself. So how does the violence sort of um, um, uh, spread? How do you contain it? What's the best policy for doing that? Um, and then over the 50-year period of the journal when it was established, uh, there's been a shift from um, interstate to, to civil wars, and civil wars as a, as a subject of research unto its own, and it's reflected in the journal. Uh, one of the really striking things, I'm going to make Nils laugh again, because I cannot say these Scandinavian names with such a plum as Henrik, um, but uh, John Galtung wrote the first article on territory and war uh, in 1972, so he founded the journal. So that was a really sweet little nice nugget to open the article that the founder of the journal, the founder of the Peace Research Institute, and basically the founder of conflict studies, um, wrote the first article on territory and war. But it wasn't until seven years after the journal was founded, and it was on the two careers. So if you look at the number of articles on territory and war across the 21 journals, so these are our main journals that we all read. We may not subscribe to them, but we're pulling it out. There was over 200 articles, um, and 36 of them appeared to JPR and 198 of them appeared across the other journals. Um, this is looking, like I said, at the causes, conduct, and resolution, and you can see that the conduct of war, the actual fighting, war fighting, is where we have the least amount of information um, in terms of empirical and theoretical insights. Uh, and then the onset and causes are quite a few. 
This is the number of articles that have addressed territory and interstate war versus civil wars, so intrastate wars. And you can see um, interstate war gets a little bit more pride of place, um, but civil wars um, um, are also um, getting quite a bit of study, which is interesting because if you go back into the 1960s, and I'd say into the 1970s, it didn't, you know, people thought that you couldn't study civil wars as a block, as, as a set of cases that can be compared. It really wasn't until the 1990s that the field of civil, I would say the subfield of civil wars within security studies and IR became um, a, a subject that we felt we could really compare um, across one another. They were one-offs. The first person actually to do it was Robert Bates <coughs> back in the 1970s, but it really didn't take off until the 1990s where people started saying, maybe these aren't idiosyncratic, maybe we can learn across the different um, cases. And then, of course, that Roy Licklider article in APSR, I think that's what really supercharged our field, really taking cow. Because if you used cow in the early days, it was all interstate. It wasn't until Roy Licklider published that piece. He's at Rutgers in APSR where he used cow, the Civil War cow data, and showed that actually you could discern patterns. And Gerald, back to you, genocide. What he showed very disturbingly is, is that it's great to get victories, but then you're more likely to have genocide after. And then the percentage of articles using qualitative and quantitative, here we do see the split, where you see empirical. So one of the things I looked at, what, what was the, the, the contribution of this piece? What did the author say was the contribution? And then after reading the article, what did I feel was the main contribution? And empirics is taking over. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. We have great data now. Why not use it? It's not, you know, we, don't, we can only have so many theoretical insights. Um, but um, uh, the question is, is actually whether people think they're making a theoretical contribution when they actually may not be. They may be testing hypotheses that we've all been banding about, orders of that. But then, of course, the question is under what conditions. Um, and so if you're a graduate student in here or, you know, somebody looking for a new project, I think that the, a place where you could really sort of get some traction is understanding the conduct of war um, and sort of understanding once the war and violence uh, happens, uh, how does it spread? Can it be contained? And there's some work being done on that, but there's a lot of places where it can, um, uh, uh, we, we, we can have some more uh, research done. So the key findings, there's a lot of them in the paper. So I'll start with uh, territory itself. John Vasquez, I think, has done some of the most important work on this, looking at the sort of territoriality, his work on war and violence. Um, so most I had interstate territory wars, it's over territory. That is the issue over which uh, combatants are fighting. And it's increased over time, which I was surprised. I actually would have thought it would decrease over time. Um, and then if you look at most civil wars and the Walter um, piece uh, on ethnicity, they sort of underpin this as well. Uh, most civil wars involve territory. And if you look at most civil wars today, it's over territories, over groups or states and groups, fighting over who's going to control a pride of place. Um, borders, borders are bad, and so a lot of duking it out within the literature is why and how are they bad, um, and, and the contestation. And it seems that uh, it, what, what two things are really critical is whether there are actually concrete borders drawn, right, do, and, and acknowledged and, and recognized. And then uh, those that don't have international standing, and Beth Simmons and some colleagues have looked at this, those are the ones that are most prone to violence. So you think about India, Kashmir. Uh, where we didn't have um, borders that were concretely drawn. Uh, you can go to the Caucasus, there's some region of the Caucasus, borders aren't there, and then uh, they're not internationally recognized. It seems to matter. Boaz at Zili has been working on this. Escalation, uh, it turns out that if the fight is over territory, it's much more likely to not always start, but escalate. And so some work's been done in arms races, uh, and then enduring rivalries, and how the fight uh, continues. And then some theories, so I'll take issue with you, Gerald. I don't know if we're supposed to have a debate on our round table, but actually <laughs> I present a lot of the different theories that people attribute to why territoriality might lie at the heart and, and uh, for the onset termination and conduct of war. Material is strategic worth, there's no denying it. Land's valuable, ports are valuable, Russia wants its Black Sea fleet because it needs a warm water port, hundreds of years old argument, but it's a, it's a compelling argument, right? It really does need access. Although, Henrik, you can tell us with Arctic warming, maybe they don't need the Black Sea Fleet. We should go to Putin and say, no, it's opening up in the north for you now. Um, and then uh, symbolic worth and uh, indivisibility. 
uh, and whether the groups interpret it as being indivisible or not, and how they bring that narrative to the bargaining table, which brings the third major theory, which is bargaining reputation. Right, so states and groups uh, don't want to de-escalate, uh, and so they, and particularly over territory, it tends to escalate into violence more often than other issues. And then finally, I just had a piece out, I've been thinking a lot about evolution, why is it we keep fighting over territory? Uh, John Vasquez made the original argument, my co-author and I, Dom Johnson, sort of extended, that humans are just soft-wired. There's just something about us, good fences make good neighbors. Um, you know, we, we joke about peeing on another person's territory. There's just something about being human uh, that, that, that compels humans to go to war as, as individuals, aggregations of nations, and then into states. So I'll end it here. Thank you very much, uh, Monica. Third paper uh, is by uh, Valerie Kubi, uh, along with uh, Gabriel Spelker, Tobias Donald, and uh, Thomas Bernauer. Do natural resources matter for interstate and interstate uh, armed conflict? And Valerie is a professor uh, at the Center for Comparative and International Studies at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, and professor at the Institute of Economics at the University of Bern. like uh, to congratulate JPR for its, on its fifth anniversary. Also, I would like to congratulate all the people of JPR from the editors to the contributors for a job well done. And finally, I would like to thank the editors of the special issue, Jack Levy, Harvard Buhau, and of course, the editor of JPR, Kendrick Urdal, for invite us to contribute to this special issue. It was a really an honor for us. And do natural resources matter for interstate and intrastate conflict? Uh, the objective of this paper is to review and assess the existing theoretical and empirical findings which link renewable and non-renewable resources, natural resources, to intra and interstate conflict. Oops. Now, renewable resources are uh, related to conflict via scarcity. And the idea here is that scarcity creates competition, and as a result, you know, humans fight. However, there is another strand of literature which says things do not really exactly work like that, because under conditions of scarcity, humans can find ways to deal with that uh, different, via different mechanisms. And Empirical research so far has focused mainly on interstate conflict. There is a lot of research at the interstate level, but it focuses mainly on water issues. Uh, and the, the most important finding is not that scarcity creates conflict, but rather that uh, states tend to cooperate uh, rather than fight over uh, shared water resources. Uh, there is a lot of qualitative research at the uh, interstate conflict, and most of it shows that, yes, a scarcity leads to conflict. However, a large end studies provide mixed results. Regarding now the non-renewable resources, non-renewable resources um, are related to, to conflict via quite a few mechanisms. A mechanism, abundance provides finding opportunities for rebels. It makes states an attractive target, weakens the state, and creates grievances, and this is a few of the mechanisms via which um, abundance uh, leads to conflict. Uh, but on the other hand, there is another strand of theoretical literature which says that abundance does not necessarily lead to conflict, and the reason is because uh, leaders could use this extra money okay, to buy off peace, and this can be done uh, through uh, via repression, patronage, and some type of distributive uh, policies. Uh, what the empirical evidence shows is that, with the exception of oil, uh, results are again mixed. So this is our reading of the literature. And when we did that, when we reviewed the existing literature, 
uh, we found out that uh, the links between uh, natural resources and conflict is quite complex. And we believe that for the most part, uh, the casual mechanisms are under, under specified. Yes, we have all these mechanisms, but they have not been really you know, worked out thoroughly. And at the same time, we do believe that there are quite a few empirical uh, shortcomings. So we think that uh, in the future, uh, research should consider intervening factors such as political and economic institutions. I'm not saying that there is no literature so far. Actually, recently, there is quite some uh, literature uh, which deals with this political and economic institution, but a little bit more focus, it would be really a good idea. Uh, also, we should consider grievances more explicitly. And most importantly, at the empirical side of this li literature of, this, of the future research, we should consider that institutions might be endogenous to conflict. Uh, also, we found out that, you know, we know that resource and conflict are, uh, are endogenous, and as a result, the effect of resource and conflict are, you know, in any type of research that doesn't consider this endogeneity issue are going to be biased. So, I, we consider that in the future, uh, the research should um, deal systematically with this kind of endogeneity issues. Uh, until recently, uh, a few years ago, uh, the focus was on states, okay, uh, and we know that resources are not uh, distributed homogeneously uh, over a state's territory. So, you know, we believe that uh, future research should use disaggregate data. Yes, it's been done already at a subnational level, but um, I think we should also consider uh, the individuals and also uh, the households. And the reason is that individuals are the ones who, after all, pick up arms. Uh, also, we saw in, in reviewing the literature that um, the focus is on armed conflict, civil war, uh, mainly, or civil conflict, but, you know, that it's not the case in most of the, most of the time. Uh, civil wars, you know, it's a rare event, and uh, the future, future research should concentrate on lower levels of violence. Uh, they are, during, you know, during the past, we didn't really have good data on uh, at the lower level of political violence, and that would have been extremely hard, but uh, during our days, nowadays, uh, there are quite a few data sets coming out uh, which code state at the lower level. And this is what uh, uh, future research should look at. Finally, uh, we found out that um, most of research is focused on interstate conflict. There is very, very little research on interstate conflict. And there is a possibility that in the future, you know, scarcity or abundance of resources might have something to do with uh, intrastate conflict. So future research should also consider the nexus of resource uh, and intrastate conflict. That were the main points in our paper, and thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much, uh, Wally. Uh, the fourth and last uh, paper to be presented. Uh, is by uh, Isaac Swenson uh, uh, and Peter Wallenstein, Talking Peace, International Mediation in Armed Conflicts. And Isaac is Associate Professor at the Department of Peace and Conflict Research at our uh, uh, brother or sister institution at uh, the Uppsala University. Thank you very much. Let me start by uh, congratulating JPR on its 50th anniversary. Uh, I consider myself an example of the third generation of peace researchers. We have the pioneers and the founding fathers and we have the, the phase of institutional building uh, where peace research was established. Uh, uh, and we are now in 
sort of a third phase stage of the peace research, where uh, peace research is no, not any longer on the margins, but in the very core of, of international relations and political science. And, and, and to a large extent, this is the result of, of the JPR. So uh, I would like to express my uh, gratitude to, the, in particular, the editors, Johan Jaltung and Nils Pelletlevich, uh, and Henrik Burdahl, for uh, this quite remarkable, remarkable achievement over the years. Uh, our paper is on mediation, international mediation. Uh, and if we, mediation is a foreign policy tool, it's a tool of foreign policy for countries and international organizations. If we compare that tool to other tools, uh, such as aid, for instance, or peacekeeping, uh, mediation has received much less of, of attention, scholarly attention. Think about all the work that has been done on international aid, for instance. There's a lot, and, and also on, on peacekeeping. But this is starting to change over the years, uh, the last years. Uh, and this is partly due to developments within research. We've seen a, grow, a growth of uh, um, uh, both sort of theoretical debates linking mediation to the core debates of, of uh, of uh, the discussions in international relations, such as foreign, for instance, but also the development on, on the uh, methodological side, so the, the development of data sets, for instance. And here JPR has played a, a, a very important role in using and publishing uh, data sets on uh, co aspects of conflict resolution and, and international mediation. But it's also a reflection of that there is uh, in development in the, the policy and practice world. So, in international mediation, it's, it's changing uh, rapidly. If we think about the definition of international mediation utilized by Jacob Berkowitz, one of the founding fathers of empirical uh, mediation research, it has a criteria that it, it should be an ad hoc measure. Something of an ad hoc measure. And this is changing now. We have seen more and more of institutionalization of international mediation, the growth of uh, support structures and, and uh, institutions and a profilation of uh, actors engaging in international mediation. Uh, in this article we discuss uh, some of the current debates and challenges within international mediation. Uh, in particular, we are focusing on the question of, of uh, where mediators go. We look on the question of mediation bias, mediation and the role of mandates in mediation, and the question of, of which kind of mediation strategies are most effective. Uh, we also discuss the issues of, of uh, data development. Uh, let me mention uh, some few things about uh, these items, although I will not go into detail. Uh, one of the um, important questions in mediation research right now, I think, is the, the dependent variable, the success of mediation. And I have a little bit of concern with the mediation literature as it stands right now, because there is a uh, have been a lot of attention on the explanatory variables and the independent variables, developing the, the measures of uh, and the models for explaining uh, success. Whereas the basic dependent variable has been treated quite in quite a um, simple, even simplistic way. Uh, and the basic problem is that uh, in the measurement of mediation success, we do not take into consideration the mandates of mediators. We do not take into consideration what the mediators were supposed to do. So the most common indicators of uh, success is conflict termination or peace agreement uh, or sustainable peace, durable peace or crisis recurrence. 
but they all rest on the implicit assumption that all mediators have the same mandate, and that with the echo, we use some generalized measurement to measure uh, success. And this is a problematic uh, assumption, implicit assumption, that I think uh, future research uh, we need to handle, we need to start to examine, uh, take into account the, the, the mandates of the uh, mediators when we are measuring the effect of their uh, interventions. Another debate in, uh, in mediation has to do with the where mediators go. And the basic debate here is whether mediators select the, easier, the easiest or the hardest cases. Uh, this has not yet been resolved, although when we review the, the um, literature, uh, most evidence points to that media, mediators actually go to the hardest cases. But here again we need to think about how to um, pursue this in the future, and, and particularly how we could disaggregate the analysis to different types of mediators. So different mediators, different, different types of mediators go to different types uh, of conflicts. Um, another important debate uh, evolves around mediation bias. And we have seen over the years uh, a development from mediation bias being examined in particular in the sort of social psychology framework, uh, where impartiality of mediators were taken for granted and even in some research included in the very definition of mediation. Uh, and that was later uh, challenged by um, rational choice scholars who focus more on the question of leverage, how mediators can and leverage over the borders. And in the last um, uh, decade, we have seen, as within the border, IRV, a focus on bargaining uh, fields. And here the main focus has been on under what conditions are mediators credible? Credible as transfer of information uh, uh, that can help to mitigate information failures, or credible as, as guarantors of peace agreements. Uh, in the article we also discussed the issue about uh, further developments of, of um, uh, data uh, and there's also another article in, in the special issue that deals more uh, specifically with this. Uh, but there's, um, there has been over the years quite a move away from using country as the basic use of unit of analysis or conflict as, as the basic unit of analysis. Conflict are defined in three, in three elements, through three elements. The parties, behaviors, and issues in conflict or incompatibilities. And we have seen for the last years quite a development on disaggregating the behavioral aspects. And that's the, all, all the work on geocoding, which is uh, fantastically interesting. Uh, we have also seen a lot of work on disaggregating on the party dimensions, so the actor dimension. We've seen that in the development of dyadic analysis, for instance. But issues uh, in the study of civil wars and interstate armed conflict, that is, uh, has remained uh, relatively uh, undisaggregated. We have the distinction between government and territory, which Monica was also discussing earlier. But beyond that, we don't have, have not disaggregated on the issue dimension. Uh, and I think from a conflict resolution perspective, that is a very important next step for research to do. But once again, I would just like to uh, highlight the, the, the contribution that uh, JPR has made to the field and uh, congratulate on the 50th birthday. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Isaac. Um, I'm going to turn uh, the floor over to uh, our two uh, commentators. First to Jack uh, Goldstone. Uh, Jack is the Virginia E. and John T. Hazel Professor of Public Policy at George Mason University. 
and uh, also a non-resident uh, senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, Jack. Thank you very much. Um, of course, great congratulations to JPR, it's 50th anniversary. For many of us in the room, it's sobering to think we are older than JPR. <laughs> which shows how far things have come in this field of peace research in a very short time that we can celebrate this anniversary. Um, I don't want to bite the hand that is feeding us here, but as a discussant and um, uh, called upon to add things to the conversation, I'm going to raise a question that I admit is unusually self-serving for me, but comes from my perspective. And that question is, why has the study of revolutions been marginalized or absent in the study of peace research and international relations. Now, this is not a new issue. Uh, in 1990, Fred Halliday, the London School of Economics, did a paper on why is it that revolutions are neglected in the study of international relations. So this has been an ongoing issue. But it's quite striking to me when I look through this 50th anniversary issue, there are articles on civil wars, on conflicts, on violence, but there's virtually no mention of revolutions. There's virtually no reference to the major work on revolutions. And this is not just JPR. Um, if you do a quick Google search for special issues on revolutions to see which journals have devoted space to this, there was one issue on the color revolutions in the Journal of Post-Communist and Transition Societies in 2009. There was a special issue in signs on unfinished feminist agendas in revolutions, ideological and political, and that's all that comes up. None of the major political science or IR journals have devoted an issue to revolutions in the last decade. If you Google APSR, or American Political Science Review, and revolution, you won't find hardly any articles. There was a very good article by Mark Beisinger last year on the Ukraine Orange Revolution and the difference between an urban and a guerrilla war. But otherwise, hardly any articles on that topic in the leading journal in the last several years. Um, I'm going to pump for my little book that just came out. <laughs> Revolutions, a very short introduction. Oxford University Press, $10, <laughs> easy to get. But <laughs> you know, I, I raised this not just because the book came out, but several panelists have mentioned Ukraine. We're in the midst of looking at a major international relations issue that is issuing from a revolution. Now, was what happened in Ukraine a revolution? I'll just read a paragraph from chapter three of this. <laughs> you tell me, okay? Um, in the first phase of revolution, state breakdown, the state loses control of society. In cases of central collapse, which I say is one mode, the regime has already weakened greatly, usually far more than is evident. The government may be nearly bankrupt, it has been losing legitimacy with business, administrative, and military elites for some time, and popular groups have been mounting local protest strikes or rural revolts in recent years. Such revolutions may start with peasant revolts or, urban, or uprisings in rural areas, or with urban demonstrations. They may be precipitated by a short-term economic downturn or price spike, a military defeat, a manipulated election, or new and resented actions by the government. Whatever the initial impetus, it's swiftly followed by major demonstration in the capital city. The government tries to disperse the demonstration, but encounters surprising difficulty in doing so. Initial efforts by the government are followed by expanding demonstrations. Police forces are unable to cope with the urban disorders, and the government faces a situation where the military has to be called in. Yet the military refuses to act decisively to clear the streets. Key units may stand aside, while others may even defect and go over to the opposition. The inaction of the military acts as a signal to the ruler, elites, and population that the regime is defenseless. Crowds surge and take over the capital. Similar mass demonstrations spread to other cities. And all of this generally unfolds over a few weeks or at most a few months. The ruler may then flee or be captured, while elites supported by crowds or the military take over government buildings and set up a provisional government. That's exactly the script of what happened in Ukraine over the last few months. It's nothing new. It's happened over and over again. That's why it's possible to write the script well in advance. The book was published in January. Yet, people continually misunderstand what's happening in Ukraine today. I've seen people say, well, it's just like the Orange Revolution. Why should Putin be alarmed? 
Why should he have made a move? It's completely different. The Orange Revolution was a contested election. There was a Supreme Court ruling that the election was invalid. There was a new election. And although Yukhanakovich was defeated, his party remained important. He remained a player in Ukrainian politics. It was definitely a challenge, an insurrection of sorts, but it wasn't a violent revolution leading the ruler to flee, leading to a provisional government without constitutional basis. And most of all, and critical for international relations, the Orange Revolution did not create the same uncertainty and anxiety about the new regime in Kiev that was the result of the Maidan Revolution that we've just seen. And international relations has seen that revolutions frequently precipitate international crises and even war precisely because they create anxiety about the uncertainty of the new regime. How much authority does the new regime have? What will their goals be? Will they be more extreme nationalist or not? All of these things that people kind of poo-pooed, if you look at the history of revolutions, you have to take very seriously when you look at what happened in Ukraine. But what I've seen over and over, it's quite remarkable, the study of international relations likes to think of nations as rational actors making decisions whether or not to initiate or respond to conflict. It's more difficult to think of nations as messy, internal, uh, emergent complexity, unstable uh, entities. Um, therefore, IR has kind of left the study of revolutions to comparative politics. And so regional experts will write on revolutions. There are a couple of good books by Mark Lynch and James Gelbin on revolutions in the Middle Arab Middle East. But as you probably know, the revolutions in the Middle East came as a complete surprise because most of the regional specialists, having studied authoritarian regimes, had developed theories about the persistence of authoritarian regimes in the region and were quite surprised. Oh, but in fact, if you look back just a generation, the entire Middle East was convulsed by revolutions. That's how the Ba'ath regime came to power. That's how the Nasser regime came to power. If people had a broad perspective on revolutions, you would say the history of North Africa and the Middle East is one of dictatorships succumbing to radical revolutions at a generational interval. But of course, all of that was lost. Similarly, when the uh, communist regimes in the, 19, the late 80s, early 90s, fell all across Eastern Europe and in the USSR, the specialists on communist and party regimes were stunned, taken by surprise, because they hadn't seen revolutions in that region since World War II or even earlier. Um, it seems to me that revolution is the field that people continue to deny. Uh, civil wars, as Monica pointed out, became an area of major study after Roy, Rick, uh, Roy Licklider introduced uh, systematic data analysis. And there has been a development of data on revolutions big data on the use of Twitter and social media, uh, new data based on polling on the people who participated in revolutions from 1989 to 2004, and even to the recent Egyptian revolution. We are now able to get data that we couldn't get for earlier historical cases. So there's a lot of work to be done. Now you would think with what happened in Ukraine, what's happening now in Venezuela, what's happening in Turkey, uh, Brazil, Thailand, there are civil disruptions all over. You would think revolutions would be a very important topic for political science, international relations. But I have to ask, why is it absent? It's absent from the curriculum. Uh, I looked uh, recently for comparative curriculum uh, issues at the uh, courses being taught, Harvard, Yale, Stanford, Princeton. Not one of them is teaching a course on revolution at the undergraduate or graduate level. You can find courses on the American Revolution. You can find courses on the Information Revolution. If you Google revolutions, you get a lot of articles on the revolution in 3D printing. But you don't find serious academic study or research on this topic. It's so bad, in fact, that um, Colin Beck at Pomona recently published an article on the stagnation of research in revolutions. And it's asked, why hasn't there been major progress in the last 10 years? But in fact, there are no faculty that have any major appointments in any of the major research departments who focus on revolutions. You'll find people who, of course, do civil wars, international wars, and so on, but it's, it's really very hard. There's no center for the study of revolutions and so on. Now, again, it's an important area, but you know, the U.S. military has the same blind spot. The military always says, we're warriors. We don't do peacekeeping. We don't do state building, but that's all they do. For the last 20 years, most of the United States international relations interventions around the world 
have been to shore up fragile states to intervene. You know, the, the Kuwait war was the exception. Most US military engagement has been exactly what the military says it never does. Most major civil wars in recent years have been the product of revolutionary change of regimes. Most international crises have similarly been. So I won't go on uh, any longer, although I could, but uh, I'll simply raise the question <laughs> for JPR, for APSR, for major research departments all around. Revolutions are very, very important events. They change the international system. They change domestic politics. Yet they have been systematically understudied. Maybe they were thrown out when Marxism was thrown out. Maybe the complexity and the multivariability of these events makes them difficult to study. But there is a real opportunity, I think, to advance the study of peace research, advance civil wars, advance international relations by going back to systematic comparative understanding of revolutions. Did you bring some extra copies for Sam? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they are the Oxford booth in the exhibition hall. I, I have one. Thank, Thank you very much. Uh, I, I would just like to say that, uh, that we do appreciate some, uh, some um, resistance as well. We're not only <laughs> inviting you to hail the JPR, but uh, you know, the, uh, the proliferation of new ideas of, of things we can do is certainly something that will keep us on our toes. Uh, I can't promise you that we're going to have a special issue on revolutions anytime soon, but we will have a 2015 issue on social media, uh, which is going to uh, get edited by uh, Nils Weidmann, which uh, will be addressing a lot of issues uh, that I think you will find uh, interesting. Uh, finally, I'm going to turn over to uh, Scott Gates uh, for the last uh, comment. Uh, Scott is research professor at the Peace Research Institute of Slow, PRIO and also former director of uh, Priya's Center for the Study of Civil War, lasting from 2003 to 2013. So he's been in a good position to see the field evolve. So. I'm also a professor at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology and a guest researcher at uh, the Department of Economics at the University of Oslo, just collecting institutional affiliation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the inside guy. With, and I've been connected with JPR for a very long time. Uh, JPR actually is the reason I met Prio. Uh, actually, it's Nils Petter in this role. It was at a JPR uh, meeting in a garden party at Nils Petter's that I met my wife. Uh, <laughs> this was Nils Petter's mission anyway. Uh, he has two missions to keep me in Norway, and the other was how to figure out how uh, Scott figured out with a bunch of Hovards, and then <laughs> a woman named Hovard Son as her last name. So I fit both patterns, and uh, basically, if it weren't for JPR, I wouldn't be at Prio, and I wouldn't probably be on this panel. Um, maybe I might be. But, um, I'm the inside guy, so I'm actually going to say something more um, and uh, take a uh, little tiny issue because I'm like the representative for JPR. Um, and Jack's right. I think we do need to, I really agree very strongly with uh, his comment that in a, it's not just uh, Niels Feidman's uh, special issue, but also the nonviolent uh, issue, special issue, very much addresses the social movement, the processes involved, which also involve the non-revolutionary outcome, so um, with transitions. So, but I think the, the point is well taken. But there's a broader range that I do actually think we're starting to appreciate and start to focus. Um, I w let's go to what I was going to say originally, um, <laughs> and uh, I was going to try to summarize what I felt was where JPR has moved since that garden party that uh, was so fateful to my life. Um, and already certain themes were emerging. Uh, the reason I was there was Nils Petter was on a leave of absence and I was taking over as the editor for a year while Nils Petter, for a number of months while he was in Germany on a leave of absence. Um, but a lot of things were being put in place during that time that I regard as very innovative and that's what I want to spend my time on, is highlighting the real innovations that JPR has been part of. And I'm not saying we have exclusive rights on these innovations, but I think JPR has been very, very much in the forefront. And I think the special issue, 
at, this, at the reception last night we talked about and Christian Berg Harpfig and Director Trio mentioned yesterday, don't just take your favorite article, read the whole thing. Um, uh, but I will say this, uh, Phil Schroth, if you do quantitative work, you got to read that piece and, and, and take home some of the, the messages there. It's too often that uh, I'm going to discuss it today and I think um, people would have benefited by having read that article. Um, okay, uh, I was, what brought me back, I was at Prio and then I actually did bring uh, my wife to the US, <laughs> but what brought me back again was the Center for the Study of Civil War. And Henrik, when he first asked me to be on this panel, he wanted me to talk a little bit about the center, um, not a center for the study of revolutions, but the center for the study <laughs> of civil war, um, was to talk about kind of parallels and how the two institutions work together. And I was part of both, Ms. Petter, and I wrote the original proposal for the center for the study of civil war. And of course, because the two of us were engaged in trying, he especially with JPR, both of us with the center, there's going to be some commonalities. And let me go through several themes that I think are common to both, but really highlight what I think JPR's innovations are. One, a multidisciplinary attitude. But I want to highlight something about it. It's not cross-disciplinary. It's not some special hybrid that's a mix. It's disciplinarily bounded. So writing occurs by economists that is disciplinary bounded by what economics does and what it is, is good at, what political science, what sociology does. And it's more not some sort of mixed bag, but it's a discipline-based orientation that is open to different fields. And I think that's a really important distinction, and I think it's something that characterizes JPR that distinguishes it from many of the other journals that are in political science or international relations in that we truly do have a more mixed bag. Number two, and I think this is really something I really emphasize for CSCW, and that is the focus on disaggregation. We've heard a little bit about it, um, but one of the things first starting, and if you go and read Todd Sandler's work going way back, it's disaggregation of time, appreciation of event data, detrending the analysis, and all these types of things, and the type of innovative work on terrorism really fundamentally was an appreciation for the role of time, not aggregating time over a, a period, but actually disaggregating time over moments, over and appreciating the appreciation. Um, Monica mentioned phases of conflict. This is related to that, an appreciation for how events, how time can be disaggregated. Um, the second thing is the one that Monica was featuring and I think is very much identified with research at PRIO, and that is spatial disaggregation. Moving away in the way that uh, Isak was talking about, moving away from this old notion of country year as a unit of analysis. And fundamentally, moving away from that and appreciating much greater variation within the nation state or those boundaries. There's also mentioned, we talked about the disaggregation of institutions. Um, Robert Hegre's article, which hasn't been discussed yet, but very much is about the disaggregation in fundamentally appreciating that democracy is a multifaceted concept, involving many dimensions, and an appreciation for that disaggregation is important. Desegregation of actors, and as Isak was talking about at the end of his presentation, the disaggregation of issues. What, what are the dimensions by which the conflict is fighting? But disaggregation as a concept, moving away from aggregate concepts, is very, very important, and JPR has very, very much been a forefront publication of articles in this way. Relating particularly to Phil's article, but I think as an aspect, and that is forecasting is another element here. Um, the actual appreciation of prediction, the, um, the articles that have appeared engaging with out-of-sample um, examinations, these kinds of appreciation for the forecasting or predictive nature of our estimations and a real true appreciation for that um, quasi-experimental nature of how we should be conducting our research. Then I'll move to data, and I think this is really where we think of JPR that's 
It's the data, and it's the data features. The data features are what I regard as other journals have them, but from my perspective, I believe that they've copied us. This is a form of um, emulation, and uh, what the best form of compliment is that they're doing it themselves. But when I think of JPR and I talk to other people, that's often what they mention, the data features. And the data features being much broader and in orientation. A lot of this dates back to our long cooperation with Uppsala and the armed conflict data set, but it's branched out much more than that. Uppsala has been very much engaged in not just the conflict data, but expanding itself in these ways. But what JPR has done is provided a, a forum or forum for presenting new data. And this is something that's fundamental to us understanding new data sets and being able to, avail, um, to use them. And related to this is the replication policy. And I want to really, really emphasize the pioneering role that Nils Petter took within our discipline, um, within ISA as a, as a broad organization. Nils Petter was so far out on replication policies. JPR was very much engaged in this. This connects to the data orientation, and I think a very strong niche aspect of what JPR stands for. Finally, um, I want to apologize for a missing chapter. Um, there was a little bit of a discussion about uh, there should have been a theory on the bargaining theory of war. Monica's chapter touches upon it. Uh, Chris Butler, who's in the audience, and I were supposed to write an article on it, and it's my fault, entirely my fault, that it didn't get written. Uh, it's been a major theoretical innovation. Um, but what I really want to highlight and tie back to that is that I think one of the best uh, ways to move forward with the bargaining theory of war is to appreciate how that model, most often just treated as a metaphor, not truly as a model, and I want to underscore that we should really be treating it as a model, um, not just merely as a metaphor, but the role of what happens when you start disaggregating but if you start disaggregating the issues, the actors, the aspects of that, and how does that affect the bargaining theory of war? And it's an area where I think we can move uh, forward in great strides. And uh, with that, I'm just going to end with saying um, congratulations to 50 years, well done, and particularly the last uh, 15, I think, have been uh, truly remarkable for the general peace research. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Scott. We've now reached the point where uh, we're going to open, we have roughly half an hour for uh, comments, uh, questions, uh, and uh, uh, suggestions for uh, upcoming special issues. <laughs> So, okay, just one. Two, yeah. Because I think, and Niels Petter, I think you're responsible. One innovation that you didn't mention, Scott, is you know in the American Academy, we're all supposed to be, you know, designing houses, building houses, and and then decorating those houses. And I think what JPR has done is shown the value of co-authorship. And I think it's shifted the field that there isn't as much pressure on junior scholars. It's okay. It's not scary to start doing co-authorship because, of course, to get tenure, it's just there have been questions, what was your contribution in that? And I think JPR, I didn't look at this, but it would be a really interesting measure to see what proportion of your pieces, JPR's pieces, have been co-authored versus other journals. And I'm not talking just dual authorships, I'm talking teams of authors. And um, I think that that's a real advance and innovation that JPR has done, and I think the Academy, at least the American Academy, um, is it is now recognizing that perhaps co-authorship is not necessarily a problem in assessing for tenure. I'm going to come from Cornell with the University of Berlin, now retired. Uh, I've uh, subscribed uh, uh, to the Journal of Peace Research from the very beginning uh, as a student, and I've followed the changes. Uh, I've not become, because of the journal, modifier. Uh, I've stayed in the qualitative tradition of social, historical research and especially conceptual research, very much influenced by Kosselic and others. And I think if I look back, uh, Galton's 
structural theory, imperialism, and his writings on revolution certainly influenced a lot of us when we were high school, when we were at university. Uh, so many other articles of the 60s triggered a tremendous debate across the globe. And I think with the narrowing, so I'm not criticizing this, but with the narrowing on the uh, quantitative analysis, a lot of the attractiveness of, of the triggering conceptual debates has moved from the journal somewhere else. And uh, I think this I would like to encourage for the next 50 years to broaden the scope methodologically and to address more uh, also conceptual analysis that may be a little bit against the mainstream also of the journal, but that trigger innovative debates. Let me just give you one example uh, uh, of what Vali has referred to, uh, looking on the environment security research, both uh, on scarcity and uh, the old debates. I don't see so much new. I see a lot of new debates that not re they are not reflected in the journal of peace research. Let me just give you uh, a few references. If you look at natural resources, if you look at scarcity, you have to look also at the strategies that undercut scarcities, innovation, decoupling, factor for defeat, the renewals. If you follow those strategies, that make resource conflicts less and less likely. Uh, I consider this a tremendous interesting area. But again, uh, in the JVR, the last few years, I've not seen that these debates are reflected. So maybe you should add, uh, besides the mainstream, uh, the best mainstream on uh, quantitative, quantitative research, a section on these conceptual debates, because I think they are also very important for the quantitative analysis to take into account <coughs> the challenges and then to think uh, with the tools you have how can these challenges be integrated and to move the field ahead instead of always looking back on the debates we had for the last 20 years and uh, sometimes I think polarized and have stuck. I think there are a lot of new challenges in the future, and I just want to conclude with one area of uh, debate that's just involving sustainability transition. It has a tremendous impact on natural resources, and another debate that will be addressed by the International Source Panel of UNESCO uh, of UNESCO, uh, in June in the report Decoupling. Decoupling uh, economic growth with resource use. And I think these are challenges that have tremendous relevance also for peace uh, issues in the future. To counter the probability of resource conflicts by innovation, resource revolution. Thanks so much for your patience. Thank you, uh, Hans Gunter. Um, I, I, I just want to make perfectly clear, which I also said in my introduction, that, that JPR is, is then be open to different methodological uh, orientations. Uh, I think I'll leave it at that. But Nisbet, did you want to comment specifically on that? or? Okay. Then uh, Todd Sandler is next on the list. I'll keep this really short. Um, Jack, you missed all the literature in economics and revolution. And let me mention Herschel Grossman's uh, really, really important work. Tamor Horan, really important work. Uh, Brock Lumberg, and I can go on and on. Yeah, that's um, in economics, not what the science. Well, yeah, but it crosses over, and it's about revolutions per se. And since we have Google at the uh, about fingertips, it would come up under Google. And on uh, Monica, a very brief point, uh, how, what do you do when there's more than one uh, reason uh, for civil war? I mean, if it's territory and mighty ethnicity, and both of them together, how, how do you code which is the, the primary one? 
Um, I would say it was mixed, mixed motives. So it's a similar argument with the UCDP data, one <laughs> maybe over a central government versus some and then it morphs out into territorial control, but they could have mixed motives. Uh, I, I found what Monica said about um, the study of territory and backyard was interesting that uh, the early articles were qualitative and moved back from in a qualitative direction. I don't think that's representative of German as a whole. The backyard was very much a uh, part of the behavioral revolution in uh, the softer social sciences. Uh, and, and I think that's evident from the start. Even in articles uh, which don't actually have the data because they weren't in the systematic data around, but the questions are asked in a nomothetic, uh, global uh, fashion, uh, opening up for uh, later quantitative analysis when the data became available. Mm -hmm. um, I think, uh, well, we'll go into the whole history of the journal. Lots of things happened, and one of the things was that. Um, um, Content analysis in, in uh, Peter Church seemed to uh, wither away a little bit because uh, there weren't any very interesting questions that were being addressed. Uh, and um, this, I think, changed fundamentally as we did a democratic piece. Uh, several have touched on that. Uh, very simple question. I mean, why is it uh, that uh, it seems that no democratic companies ever find each other? Very, very simple, elegant question which then lent itself to content analysis, and of course which has become enormously much more sophisticated uh, uh, since then. Then also asking, does it apply to civil war, does it apply to a broader set of liberal factors, uh, reviving the whole chain of conflict debate, etc., etc. And, and uh, Bohr Hager's articles, the George Schneider's articles, and especially to uh, testify to the uh, complexity uh, that's now uh, characteristic of all of those debates. So my challenge to the panel mm -hmm. is the following. Are there any other seemingly simple uh, ideas, challenge, simple <laughs> challenges that we want to think of that we sort of reinvigorate the field? Uh, I, I have to ask, I have been asked the same question when I'm talking about these research, and I don't have a good answer, but I'd like to have one, so maybe... Uh, <laughs> I think I don't know if that's how about the rest of you think? Okay, anyone who wants to... Uh... I think there's better up on that challenge. I mean, after a couple of years, I have simple questions and also simple answers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll let the, uh, the panelists talk about that question. Uh, and uh, and uh, the next on the list is, uh, is question. So, I had a comment rather than a question. And um, having written the, an article about um, data for the special issue, I was um, thinking of this in the context of the Czech question as to why isn't there more research in revolution. And of course one obvious answer is that we don't have a clear data set in revolution that is easy for researchers to use. And I was trying to think about why that might be the case. And I thought that some of the comments that you um, uh, made actually suggested why this might be difficult to do. Um, one of the reasons why we've been focused on civil war is that we have a better handle on identifying actors ex ante. In the case of revolutions, it's very difficult to know who might be the, um, who might be the possible movers, the coalitions are often ad hoc. The other comment that you made about the Orange Revolution, I think, suggested that you don't consider the Orange Revolution to be a revolution because there was no fundamental change of institution, it was simply a change of leadership. And I guess that, that suggests that we need to have sort of not just data on the things that we consider revolution after the fact, but also on the revolutionary attempts and maybe some kind of classification of, of the different dimensions of uh, outcome of process and state responses. I think it would be really fascinating if someone collected such a data, but I guess that also gives a sense of the challenges, and I'd be very interested in hearing your thoughts on that, and possibly an article for JTR on the data set. <laughs> well, you raise a lot of issues, all important. When I put together the um, encyclopedia of political revolutions about 15 years ago, I thought that might precipitate a compilation of data since we now had an enumeration of cases, but it didn't get followed up in that way. Um, it is still the case that people argue over what is a revolution and what are the key characteristics. I think that's extremely sterile. What I think is exciting about the study of revolutions, and this refers to something you mentioned, Henrik, is that we've seen constant innovation in the way people attempt regime change. 
So we have many more nonviolent revolutions now, and we have um, what I call uh, you know, color revolutions are a distinct type. And so I think, yes, the orange revolution was a revolution, but the characteristic of color revolutions is they're often relatively incomplete because there's not much in the way of polarization and violence. Rather, there's a single government that is changed in character, but people continue to fight over what the outcome will be. So whether it was in Georgia or Kyrgyzstan or in, in Ukraine, we see revolutions that are messy, incomplete, lead to further uh, you know, political struggle, and don't yield the good thing. They don't yield an authoritarian regime. They don't yield a radical ideological regime. But they do have a regime change. So I think we need to better understand the different types. I was suggesting that what happened in Ukraine in 2014 is a more radical revolution driven more by a nationalist ideology than was the case in 2004 that has led to a more dramatic change in government and a more disruptive process that raises more anxiety. So I don't say two or four wasn't. I'm saying that whole issue of what is or isn't, that's part of the interesting research now. And what determines the success of nonviolence, what determines whether violence is necessary. Uh, I just did a blog post for something forthcoming from Notre Dame saying we need to better understand the relationship between regime type and the strategies that are available to insurgents. Uh, and I just looked up, uh, Todd, um, you know, the uh, Grossman article on kleptocracy. Well, that was 1999. It was a very good economic theory. There had been a half a dozen things that built on it, but not a lot. And what you know, Jim Robinson and uh, Asimoglu have done with revolutions in the political economy sphere is not to encourage a deep empirical study, but to treat revolutions as stylized facts and use them as a component in models to study other things that they're interested in, democracy or development. So I, I take your point, but I still think there's a lot to be done, and the issues that you raise are indicative. Now, why there is not more of it, I think, really has to do with the way people view revolutions. They're out of equilibrium events. They're disruptive, they're complex, they're emergent, more difficult to deal with than something on which you can go to a data set like COW and just start running correlations. And this is where Phil Schroep, I think, makes a very good point that sometimes the accessibility of data, and the ability to look for uh, statistical incidents relationships leads you in the direction away from studying things that are maybe more unique, more rare, but also very important. But Phil will be speaking this afternoon, by the way, 145 session conference. So if you want to get more Phil Schroep, uh, you'll be able to hear him then. I, I, I very much promote what he said. Absolutely. Yeah, so, Jack, I just want to challenge you a little bit um, about this. You're saying revolutionary movements haven't changed, and I think I would no, have think, changed. I, I question that because I think what, what the big variable out there that, that has changed is the use of is the willingness of, of states to use force. I think that's changed. In the old days, prior to the 1950s, we would have thought it wasn't axiomatic, but it was more likely they would have used force. Whereas in the modern era, particularly after the 1990s and the collapse of the Soviet Union, Yugoslavia, whatever, it was a question mark. And now, you know, we, we are actually questioning whether Russia will actually use force. Well, right? And we would not have questioned that in 1970. You know, we, you know so, so one of the critical factors is willingness of these regimes. So what's changed? It seems to have been, you know, and I'm not one of these people that believes in these huge, you know, cultural shifts a la Pinker, but it does seem the willingness of states to use force to keep the regime together has diminished proportionally. Yes, we have Syria, right? It's willing to use force. But Ukraine cowed. No, 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 no. Back I, I, I completely agree. And again, that blog post that I mentioned says we can't understand what's happened unless we do take a comparative mm -hmm. long view. What you said is there are certain types of regimes that have made some partial movement toward democracy that had links with the West and the global economy. And in that kind of regime, using force, especially deadly force, against peaceful demonstrators delegitimizes the regime, loses allies, antagonizes the population. And we see many more such regimes in the last 20 years than there were previously. Mm -hmm. And that type of regime actually can be toppled more effectively by nonviolent mass protest than by violence. This is why I think the Chenoweth and Stephen uh, data set shows that result. However, there are other types of regimes in which even though many of the elite and security forces 
are starting to show a weakening attachment, there are ethnic, clan, or professional loyalties to the regime that remain very strong. Mm -hmm. And therefore, mass protest will precipitate not mass defections, but polarization. And in Syria and Libya, this is what you get. You get some defection, but a core that's tied to the regime and is willing to fight. Mm -hmm. And then there are other regimes in which you have very strong loyalty of the military, like the Revolutionary Guards and Quds Force in Iran in 2009, or like the Bahrain military. Bahrain faced the largest popular nonviolent protest in terms of percent of population involved of any country. They were allies to the United States. You would think the regime would be reluctant to use force. But the relationship with Saudi Arabia was even stronger, and the fear of the Sunnis from the Shia majority prompt. Mm -hmm. So I think, yes, we are seeing a change in the frequency and, and in the incidence of regimes that are reluctant to use force. Mm -hmm. And this has facilitated nonviolent revolutions, but you need a comparative study to say, yes, that matters in Ukraine, but what happened in Bahrain and Syria is different, mm -hmm. uh, and we need to keep that difference in mind. I, I find it amazing that people were thinking, oh, Putin, why would he, why would he move into Crimea? We expect it's a civilized world. People will act differently. But it's very situational, very regime-specific. And if you look at the way Putin has been pumping up aggressive nationalism as the basis for his legitimacy in Russia for the last few years, since his second re-election, and you look at the, the nature of the conflict in Ukraine and what it threatens to the Russian regime, it didn't surprise me at all. So, but, the, yes. I mean, but the question that we're still asking ourselves, which I don't think we would have asked ourselves three, four decades ago, is will he actually resort to large-scale force? I think it's still a question. And in, in the case of Crimea, now the Caucasus, as we know, that they did, they do, they resorted to the use of force. But Crimea is, you know, populated by Slavs, fellow, you know, white Russians, small Russians, however, that it's a different, there, there's something new here happening that, that we have to get our head around. I haven't seen any more uh, hands. If there are any burning questions, there is room for one more. If not, I think we're going to uh, wrap up the panel. Uh, I would like to thank again uh, the guest editors, Jack Levy and Holger Buhag, for their uh, excellent work on the special issue. All the authors uh, of, uh, of the papers, uh, including uh, those who are not here uh, right now. Uh, and uh, thanks to uh, Jack and to Scott for uh, commenting uh, and, and providing some uh, outside and partly inside uh, views on the uh, special issue. Uh, I would encourage you to uh, look at the articles uh, of the special issue. They're all available uh, online from the Sage uh, Journal's uh, online platform uh, and will be for still a few weeks. And there's a lot of good read there. So thank you all for showing up and uh, have a good conference.